for this practice of the Dhamma that we're engaging in uh, when we sit in meditation. One thing that we need to be careful of is drowsiness. And this sleepiness, drowsiness is an obstacle for our minds and it, it's what prevents our minds from attaining peace. If drowsiness comes up, then we need to find a skillful means to take care of that and to, to cure it. The Buddha taught different means to do this, uh, to expel drowsiness when we're sitting in meditation. One way is to think about the Dhamma and we can bring up uh, a single teaching and reflect on that, go over that. Another means is to bring up some chanting. So we could chant over the, the goodness and the, the great qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. If after doing this, then we're still feeling drowsy, we can try opening up our eyes. And if none of this works, then we should get up and practice walking meditation, walking back and, back and forth. If we're still feeling drowsy, then we can walk backwards. Or we can go into a dark place in order to try and bring up fear. And that fear can help to get rid of the drowsiness. So we should try any of these methods, whatever works in order to dispel drowsiness from our minds. And it's something that we need to be careful of when we sit to meditate. But if we carry on training, eventually we'll be able to pass this obstacle and our minds will be able to reach peace and they'll be very firm and well-founded. Sometimes it's the case that the body is feeling very weak and, uh, and it, fe it feels like it wants to have a rest. But we need to have mindfulness there and, and know what's going on. But if the body is very weak, then it's natural that the mindfulness it won't be very full. But we also can't just tell from the outside what's going on. It's possible that someone is sitting meditation and their body is displaying uh, kind of drowsy tendencies. Maybe they're swaying back and forth or nodding off a little bit. But inside, uh, the mind can be quite collected, gathered together, very peaceful. So you can't just tell this from the outside. Maybe someone is sitting there nodding off and there's a Dharma talk that's going on, but they're still able to, to know exactly what's being said in the Dharma talk, even though outside it looks like they're sleeping. So you really can't tell exactly what's going on from the outside. And it is possible that uh, someone looks like they're sleepy, but they're actually very collected and peaceful. But this being said, Mostly it is that someone is actually sleepy if they look like they're nodding off. And so we do need to be careful of this. So there are many things that prevent the mind from reaching peace. There are many different obstacles. And it's normal that these obstacles uh, are present in our mind in one form or another. So the mind may be feeling very aggravated or annoyed, angry. Perhaps it's drowsy. Or some people are of the nature to doubt a lot and not be certain about things. Or maybe there's a desire going on in the mind or a craving for sensuality. Maybe the mind uh, wants to experience some form of sensual pleasure, whether it's uh, in a form or a sound, a taste, so these are all the things that prevent the mind from experiencing peace and that stop the mind from being free. And it's just the nature of the untrained mind 
to be like this. So we know what's going on, whatever emotions are going on, we know that. If there's a lot of greed that comes into the mind, we, we try and know that. And try and stop it before it uh, gets out of control. Even if there is a huge amount of greed, then we need to to stop that from leaving through our body and speech, to restrain our actions, our body and speech within the bounds of morality. And so there was a, an instant in the time of the Buddha that there was uh, a woman, uh, Chattutara, who was the wife of uh, King Udena. And she had a a servant who, whose job it was to take flowers into the palace every day. So she would get some money and she would go off to the market and buy some flowers and then bring them back in order to decorate the palace. But one day she went to listen to the Buddha give a sermon. And through listening, there was great faith that arose within her heart, faith in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha and she uh, attained to Sotapanna. When she attained to this level, then she realized that you know, stealing or trying to trick people out of money, it's, it's not a good thing. And so that day that she came back um, with her flowers, the palace was full of flowers that one day. And uh, the queen, she was confused about this because uh, normally there weren't nearly as many flowers in, um, uh, during that day. And so she asked the servant, you know, why is this? And the servant then explained that, uh, that normally she, she took a portion of the money for herself and she only used uh, some amount of that to buy flowers. But now she had changed her ways after listening to the Dhamma. And so the queen then asked her to, to teach uh, the Dhamma that she had heard. And so she did that. She uh, put the servant up on a high seat and she listened to the Dhamma. And there were many of them that listened at the same time as well. And many of them were able to attain to the Dharma as well. So we can see then the goodness uh, of listening to the Dharma and of having sila, that it can have these results. And so the servant, she was able to, to listen to the Dharma and have enough mindfulness come up that she realized that she needed to take better care of her actions of body and speech. She needed to maintain her sila better. And if we can do this, then that maintaining of goodness through our body and speech or keeping them within the bounds of morality, it will make uh, the practice of gathering our minds into samadhi even easier. We won't want to trick other people out of money. Even though we may still want wealth, we'll see that tricking other people in order to get that wealth is beneath us. And we'll see that our morality has greater value than that money. So having sila, it allows our minds to become more stable and more firm. At the beginning, we may not see into the Dhamma, but this maintaining of our morality is something that's very important. So for the lay people, there's keeping of the five precepts or the eight precepts. For the novices, there's the 10 precepts. And then for the monks, there's the 227 precepts. And whatever level that we're keeping, whatever number of precepts that we're keeping, we should be really intent in that, in that training. And this is a basis of our mind that will allow us to, to experience peace. And so we should take care of that as best we can. Because this sila, it's like the bark of the tree. 
And then the samadhi is the sapwood, the wood that wraps around the heartwood of the tree. And banya, wisdom, is that heartwood. But a tree needs bark in order to live. And without bark, it'll just die. So this whole path of training is necessary. The aspect of sila, the aspect of samadhi, and the aspect of panya, it's all necessary. But that being said, the true worth is right in the center. So the reason that we keep our morality is in order to be able to collect our minds into samadhi. And then when this happens, the greed, hatred, and delusion that we experience will lessen to a, to a great extent, and that will make the training even easier. So we should try each day and carry on practicing, carry on practicing, and eventually we'll be able to get there. We'll be able to experience real happiness in our hearts and a sense of fullness, and the mind will feel very peaceful and very light. We can then take that peaceful mind in order to contemplate. And one way of contemplating is going over the hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, and seeing into the impermanent nature. As we carry on practicing and carry on doing this, then it'll become easier and our minds will be uh, we'll be able to teach them with ease. They'll, they'll listen to what we're saying. And then this path of sila, samadhi, panya, that are all gathered together into one, we'll see into the conventional nature of phenomena. And by that, our mind will be freed. So as we carry on with the practice and we get further and further, then it'll become easier. And each step that we go, the practice becomes easier. But at the beginning, it's very difficult because what we're trying to do is to destroy a wrong view. And that's a very tough thing to do. So we try and practice. And at, at, at the beginning, it's very difficult. But as we carry on, then it does get easier. It's very difficult at the beginning because the defilements that we have in our mind are very thick and the sense of self that we have is very thick also. So we try and to gather together our resources and our energy and use that. You know, the, the energy that we have of faith and of putting forth effort, the energy that comes from maintaining mindfulness and then samadhi and wisdom. We gather all our forces together in order to defeat these kilesas. So really be firmly intent in this because it's something that we need to be able to do. We have to make it. When we have this firm intent, then we will be able to see truth. We will, we will be able to get real Dhamma. Our minds then will be freed from the bonds, the thing that's bound them to birth and death for so many lifetimes. You know, what's taken us to be born and then get sick, age, die, over and over again, countless lifetimes. These days people are very afraid of the COVID virus because they're afraid that they'll die because of it. But the things that have made us die over and over again, these defilements, people aren't so afraid of them. But they're things that we really should be afraid of. So everyone be intent in your efforts in this practice. <laughs>